Richard Brookheiser with all that color on this morning. Uh, what are you reading? What am I reading? I am reading the stories on, uh, on the, uh, the House of Representatives signing a letter um, uh, protesting the president's policies on Bosnia. And of all the things, you, when you pick up the papers this morning, why did this get your attention? Well, on the Washington Times, it gets your attention because you have uh, this picture of a flag being stepped upon, and then it says 184 congressmen urge president to cancel mission. Then in the New York Times, which buried it in the middle, but they say it was 201 members, including 15 Democrats, had signed the letter which said simply, we urge you, Mr. Clinton, not to send ground troops to Bosnia. Christopher Hitchens, uh, you came into this room saying you saw the same thing, the same photo. I was interested in the same photograph because I was wondering if the Washington Times hadn't um, violated the provisions of the flag burning amendment that I think it otherwise editorially favors. Um, there's a, an outright desecration right on the front page of our local conservative. Right? I think, I have certainly hope, that when the amendment passes, it won't be lawful to show pictures of the American flag being blasphemed in that match. You they can put it in air quotes, can't they? And these are I foreigners. I these they are dirty ironic, foreigners. They can put ironic, but I also notice, as Richard, I think, uh, did, that um, in one of the pictures of the desecration, you can see somebody wearing a Redskins hat. Some ang That's the Washington Post, some page one of the Post. Infuriated Serb. No, it's not on the front of the Post. It's the other, I think it's the Times one. Um, some infuriated Serb. Where, where is it in the Times? Trashing old glory. And no, Washington Post. Redskins cap. Washington Post, Here, there it is. Let's Here show are. the audience. Can that we get that up? Can but this is not a color photograph. It doesn't have the same impact, does it? No. And this is on the front page of the Washington Post. A Bosnian Serb soldier holds up a torn American flag during a demonstration by several thousand Serb residents. Where's the Redskin? Oh, it's right here. Right. There it is. How about that? What does that mean? The, what does it mean? Well, it's an interesting choice of, um, he must home, be. of hometown reporting as well, because the Washington Times has missed the possibility of... Uh, well, he must, have been, he must have been the guy who photographed the other picture for the Washington Times, <laughs> presumably. Could, before we move on, to, let me ask the, the, yes. the two of you. What, what is, uh, <clears throat> if you're a conservative or if you're a liberal, what's the position you're going to take in a situation like this? Bosnian, uh, the whole issue and... Uh, it doesn't split on conservative liberal, does it? No, uh, it doesn't. I mean, I've, I wish that the international community had intervened a long time before now in Bosnia, and I found that on the whole, um, people on the left, which is where I start from, were not as keen as I was. And there were some very bizarre people on the right who were making the, or I think bizarre, who were sort of making the running, actually, principally Baroness Thatcher. Um, was saying, look, there's no, there's no reason at all to let the Serbs keep on doing this, and, and it's a disgrace and it ought to be stopped. So you're for intervening? Well, I'm not very, much, I'm not very strongly in favor of the Dayton Agreement, which I think is a bit of a sellout. I mean, I, I think the Bosnian presidency is right in saying that it is not justice, but it is perhaps peace, and peace is better than nothing. Mr. Brookheiser, where are you? Well, we, National Review, has been calling uh, for years that, uh, that the Bosnian, that the Muslims be trained, uh, that they be allowed to arm themselves, uh, but we, we don't like the Dayton Agreement. It seems to be putting the United States in the role of enforcing a peace which nobody on the ground really likes. They, they like it only because they're exhausted or they're temporarily exhausted. And, uh, and, and people have lost sight of the, of the notion of a limited national interest. I mean, we have a real national interest in stopping aggression in Europe, but uh, since the Serbs are not animated by any hostile superpower or by any hostile ideology, our interest is a limited one. And if there are people on the ground, as there are, who are willing to fight this, we should help them and let them do it. Here's the cover of a new book coming out, uh, Founding Father, George Washington Rediscovering. What would he think of this whole move to Bosnia? Well, we did. Look, uh, the book is not, my book is uh, February 22nd, by the way, is when it's coming out. Easy date, day. easy date to remember. And the point of the book is not to say, uh, to look at 200-year-old policy prescriptions and say what he would think now. Uh, the point of the book is to ask, why is this man famous? But it may not be the point, but I want to ask you. Oh, you want to ask him? Well, what do you think? Well, he, he, he was against habitual alliances with foreign powers. He said, if you have an ongoing alliance, you are a slave 
to that to that friendliness with another country, uh, which is not not pertinent in this case because we don't have any historical um, alliance or antipathy with any of the sides. Mr. Uh, Hitchens, this book which you wrote uh, with Mother Teresa on the cover. When I first saw it, I thought it might have been Mother Teresa's book that's out. Uh, what would she think of this whole? She would not be, I think, under that impression. She does have a book out of her own, or at least it's been ghostwritten for her. It's called A Simple Path. Um, I think the only fair thing to recommend is that you go to your nearest fine bookstore and order both of them. Um, but the contrast will be, will be instantly, I think, available to you. What else are the two of you uh, reading this morning? Uh, we have uh, the Washington Post, page uh, one, had a story on the vote on to ban partial birth abortions in the Senate. Yeah, we have paper it there. this morning. Yeah. It's huge here. Okay, where is 55 it? 55 to 45. It's, uh, oh. it's uh, A1. A1. 55, 45. Well, we can't find it. Anyway, why did that get your attention? Well, it got my attention because um, this this may be the beginning of, or certainly an extension of, rolling back the uh, the right to abortion that was established in Roe versus Wade, uh, which appeared to be limited in the Supreme Court's language, but but in fact is unlimited in practice, and uh, and the Senate uh, took an opportunity. To, uh, to vote against a, an egregious form of abortion. And I think we will see other, other restrictions coming out of this Congress. And this puts, and this puts the, the pro-abortion side in a box because they don't ever want to talk about the details of abortion. Yeah, there was a very um, strong piece there by a woman who'd undergone this procedure. Um, in the Times, New York Times op-ed page about a week ago, which uh, must have had a strong effect on me. I mean, she described what happened when your baby has, though it's quite well on, has in fact died inside you. And in her case, she was told it wasn't possible to induce it um, or remove it by a cesarean section uh, for various reasons that were to do with her own state of health. That this was the only way of ridding herself actually of a fetus that was already dead. And she said also the procedure isn't as scary and horrifying as it somehow has been made out. The very lurid things we've been told about crushing the skull with scissors and so forth aren't, aren't true. In fact, the dead child could be handed to her for a leave taking uh, in reasonable condition before um, it's taken away. So I don't know. I mean, I certainly would, would ask anyone who wants to think seriously and morally about this to look up, look up that piece. You, uh, you walked in with this piece on your agenda. Christians against welfare cuts are arrested in the Capitol by Frank Kleins and a barely noticed counterpoint to the budget battle. 55 evangelical Christian preachers and followers were arrested in the Capitol Rotunda today as they sought to speak up for the poor and confront lawmakers with biblical verses against retreating from society's duty to help the needy. And here's a photograph by Steve Crowley. Yeah, I'll tell you what struck me about it was the, was the opening sentence. Um, it's on page B15. And the event, which it does describe the arrest of all these clergy in the rotunda, is described as a barely noticed event, which seems to be a very st strong and bizarre a way of op opening a, a news story. I mean, that's only true if the reporter says it's true. And I brought along with me from The Nation, Ralph Nader's column um, on media matters in the current nation, which uh, has the New York Times doing this again. On November 24th, he says, the New York Times published a page one story by Tamar Lewin that explored why, quote, an odd harsh has fallen over Washington. The sound of advocacy groups that have been unable to <coughs> create much of a clamor against the most drastic cuts in decades. <coughs> Ralph uh, Nader points out, excuse me, <coughs> that the reporter, in all modesty, left out a significant explanation for this odd hush, the New York Times itself. I don't think the Times can have read this column because here is uh, one protest against the budget cuts being reported in the Times on page B15 with the intro that the protest it covers was, as it says, barely noticed. So I think it's, um, I thought it was worthy of note you have a as, if a tree as, falls, being, as being self-confirming, yes. If a tree falls in the forest and the Times doesn't hear present. it, doesn't make a sound. Uh, looking at the cover of National Review, can you explain this? It says uh, National Review hits 40. Can we get a close-up of this? I, I see Newt Gingrich and Rush Limbaugh and Fidel Castro. No, no, that's Solzhenitsyn. Oh, 
a huge mistake. Excuse me. That's why I should have kept my mouth shut. What are, who are the other people? Who's at the piano? Well, you see to the left of Rush Limbaugh is Genghis Khan <laughs> at the table there. So we are all, everyone else is to the right of Genghis Khan. Playing the piano is uh, Bach, Johann Sebastian. Uh, who do you have Ronald there? You've got Reagan. Reagan dancing with Claire Booth Luce. Uh, you yeah, have Goldwater and, yes, the subject of my book, Toasting Each Other. Who's that? That's Barry Goldwater. And then you go down here in the corner. you have any comment on this, Mr. Hitchens? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> and who you do we have? Margaret Thatcher. You have uh, Margaret Sam? Thatcher with uh, Uncle Sam. You have the Statue of Liberty lighting uh, Bill Buckley's cigar and his sister Priscilla Buckley next to him. Socrates there is mixing the ah, cocktail shaker to that. Right there. Uh, I think we erred. It should have been Aristotle. Should have been Aristotle. Well, the nation, which was, of course, founded in 1865, um, naturally congratulates all magazines that last 40 years. And I'm very pleased to see that the people who the National Review most admired when it started, who were uh, Joe McCarthy and Francisco Franco, have neither of them made they, the they didn't show up. They didn't show maybe up. Went, maybe went they, they, of the course, were given invitations <laughs> and seats at the head table, but they were unable to make it. But uh, that's progress of a kind, anyway. So we, had, so we had to give their space to Bach. Now we ask uh, Mr. Hitchens to describe what this cover is all about. Um, that's the cover of Vanity Fair. That, I think, speaks for itself. That's all about Uma Thurman. Good piece, too. Inside, a um, piece by me about the amazing fact that um, on New Year's Eve this year, at the stroke of midnight, the baby boomers will turn 50. And I think one of them will carry on turning 50 every, we worked it out, every 1.7 seconds for the rest of next year. It'll be a melancholy year for the boomers, and I've written a piece saying what a disappointment the baby boom generation has been to itself and to others. And Mr. Burkheiser, you write in the National Review uh, about the baby boomer group too. Yes. It's right here, it's called oh, Passing oh. Phase. Well, one, one of those baby boomers is going to be President Clinton. Yes. This year. 50. Turning 50. Yeah, we had, we had a whole series of articles in there about the detour of history from 1914 to 1991. Uh, we thought that the 20th century was, had not lasted 100 years. It was a rather short century. It began with World War I, and it ended with the collapse of communism. And this wasn't an original insight with us, Eric. Hobsbawm and John Lukash have also thought of it. So we had various speculations on uh, what this means to come out of that. And what I wrote about is, yes, we may be coming out of it, but uh, wh what about those of us who were born in the midst of it? And how do we, um, how do we recover from the, uh, from the limitations on our education that were placed upon us by virtue of having been born when we were? That photo you saw, or those series of photos, was from Vanity Fair. Uh, in your, in your uh, column... We rarely put Uma Thurman on our cover. <laughs> in your column... Uh, we leave these serious matters to be covered by Vanity Fair. You bring up, you say this, one of the most poignant publishing uh, phenomena of the last several years was the 70-month presence on the bestseller list of William Bennett's The Book of Virtues, who was buying that three-pound doorstop, not kids. Clearly, its purchasers were adults, many of them baby boomers, who bought it to read to their kids. You weren't, um, uh, yet they, they weren't, they also reading it for themselves, and he now has the, what, the Moral Compass, another uh, sequel and a Moral Compass for Kids, and um, bring it, that subject up for both of you. What's the fascination, do you think, with uh, the Book of Virtues? I just had to review the Book of Virtues for the, for the Times Literary Supplement. I had no idea till I was paid to read it how bad it is. Why is it bad? How shallow and boring and, and how poorly selected and how pompous. There's, the, for example, there's just, in, in a book of Virtues for American Children, there's, I think, one page from the whole of Mark Twain, and it's, it's the boring bit where Tom Sawyer paints the, whitewashes the fence. And yet there's about eight pages from one of the Watergate burglars about how he found God, or one of the Watergate burglars who did find God. It's absolute pabulum, I think. I, d I don't believe anyone has really read it unless they've, like me, been paid to do so. I'm sure it's been bought with the best of intentions, but it's a huge disappointment. Mr. Brookheiser? Well, the thing is, it's filling a gap. I mean, we had, the reason it did so well is because there's very little else out there like it. Uh, once upon a time, there were McGuffey's readers you know, which, which everybody bought, everybody read. In fact, the conservative book club has told me that their biggest selling book has been McGuffey's Readers. They just took these hundred year old collections of moral tales and reissued them. 
And the reason these things are so popular is that uh, the rest of the culture is not providing it. Uh, we're all doing Uma Thurman. I like that. I Uma can't Thurman, let that go. Uma, Uma, I can't Thurman. let go of Uma Thurman. No, well, there you are. See, he's who, a, see, met, met, who, who could? Who well, could? Is. This, is why Thurman, Vanity Thurman, Thurman, this is why Vanity Fest is a great magazine. You've shown the cover once. I know, but who and is? He can't Uma stop. Um, who is Uma Thurman? I, I'm going to read this and find out now. Do you follow? Let me say another word just about my piece. Um, <laughs> my, I don't take the, the, quite the same line on the baby boomers as does Richard, though I think the, the idea of the short 20th century is a very interesting one, and I, I've also try, uh, attempted to contemplate it. But what I've asked is, you know, what, what are we going to say? I mean, I'm, I'm a 49er myself, that's when I was born, so it's not long for me. Um, what are we going to say was our great achievement? Will it really be true that President Clinton is our typical president? I certainly hope not. I'd describe him as sort of partly a callow youth and partly a bit of a chin-pulling old bore already some of the time. Um, what has been our great moral stand? What has been our great composer or author? I mean, all, to ask any of these questions is to invite a terrible feeling of disappointment. Do you, I think you, that's true. Can you tell us uh, uh, who Uma Thurman is? Why, she's an actress. I saw her and Harry in June before I walked out of it. Well, why did you walk out of it? It was boring. Richard Brookheiser of Rochester, New York, and uh, Christopher Hitchens of Portsmouth, Hampshire, England. You're living, though, in New York City? That's right. And you're living? In Washington, D.C. And our call is from Martinez, California. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? All you gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What's on your mind this morning? Well, I always, I just thought I'd try and get it through to Mr. Hitchens, and the first time I dialed, I got through. I'm, I don't even know what to say now, because I just woke up. It's pretty early out here. Did he start on you when you woke I up? I just how you feel, by the way. A couple of quick questions. Are you going to come out to the coast to uh, flog your new book, which I'm going do a reading here in the Bay Area? Yes, I am. In fact, I'll be in the Bay Area over Christmas. I'm hoping to get a reading or two organized. Okay, I was going to say, don't be too hard on us baby boomers, you know. It's, uh, we had a lot of rate against us there. But um, mm. I, I, I wonder, it, it seems to me that I don't understand why, with all this talk about the liberal media, why there isn't one single left network. I mean, I think with all the resources of the left, if, if it were able to focus, that's what we should do. I've yes. always thought that Mr. Lamb was the... <coughs> Chief whip and organizer of the left on the air. Uh, caller, because he's committed to objectivity, um, and as um, Lenin used to say, only the truth is revolutionary. A caller, the, the, let me anticipate that the conservatives calling will say that that's what those networks are, the, uh, the 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 main commercial networks that they are of the left. Would you agree with that? That which? The main networks, the commercial. They're they're not they're not accused of being the left. They're accused of being liberal. Which ah. is totally different. But even, the, even that they're liberal is such a joke. I mean, let's talk about who owns them. Uh, the gentleman, I'll, I'll leave that to the, to the journalists here. But uh, Where are you on the political spectrum? Well, I'm a Christian anarchist myself. If you were going to characterize it as that, anything. And Henry Adams. And many others. I'm someone that believes that the Christian right is neither. Well, I think it's Christian, all right. I think it's right also. I thought that's, one of the, that's actually one of the worst bumper stickers I've seen this year, is the Christian right is neither. I would say it's obviously both. The, you know, uh, the, the notion of having one's own network, I, I speak from across the uh, spectrum to you, it, it often bemuses people. And uh, I think it's a, it's a mirage. Uh, I mean, I've, I've sat in on discussions of why don't conservatives buy ABC. There was a period when it was in bad financial shape, or why don't we do this, why don't we do that? And ultimately, uh, it's not worth thinking about, because even if you were able to do it, um, you'd, uh, you'd ghettoize yourself. And the best thing to do is to, uh, you know, as Mr. Hitchens does, as I try to do, just do your work and um, hope to do it better than other people and get in mainstream places. Yeah, and don't watch too much TV. Providence, Rhode Island. You're next. Uh, good morning. Hi. Uh, great job. I appreciate your service here. Welcome. Uh, what amuses me is as follows. Uh, when the Reagans got into office, we had a bombshell about some dishes 
a Hollywood connection. And then we had a bombshell years later about some dresses that Nancy Reagan borrowed or something. And now we have the real juicy Hollywood scandal that, oh, how these left people and liberal people would love to have uh, have had on Reagan or anybody else who's a particularly Gingrich. And I'm talking about Travelgate and Mr. Thomason and that whole gang and with the White House pass and they moved in and they abused seven career civil servants to get their way and how it's not even being touched or covered, how it is the definitive scandal and the definitive story about this Clinton and his kind and power now, how if it would be Reagan, it would be absolutely bombs away. And I just think that sooner or later, this will come out. I myself am one of the grassroots non-Christian, and I use this as such ammo to keep about 20 or 30 votes out of the Clinton column, although it's futile here in Rhode Island. But I think this particular story and the fact that it's not being covered is all the evidence I need that there's a loathsome, sickening liberal bias in this country. If this was Reagan, this is all we would have heard. All right, thanks. Well, look, in defense of liberal reporters, I think one thing that, um, that saves Clinton is what used to be called uh, uh, in discussions of nuclear missiles, fratricide. Uh, you didn't want all your nuclear missiles coming in at once because they'd blow each other up and not the target. And this was called fratricide, and it was something to be avoided. The reason Clinton uh, escapes time after time is that there are so many scandals associated with him, and they all crowd each other out and have the effect of negating each other. So I think, uh, I think that's what keeps him healthy. And yet I have the impression that Senator DiMatteo and his hearings are reported all the time. I mean, I don't, I don't think that um, it's possible to say that the story's been buried by any, any element of the media. Probably the Washington Times puts it on the front page more often than the Washington Post, but th there it all is every day. And, I mean, it seems to me also very clear that the slightly banana republic way, well, make that the very banana republic way in which Mr. Clinton and his wife ran the state of Arkansas, was, was um, imported by them to some degree to Washington. And, and th that's been found out, and it's a, it's a permanent boil on their back. Here is the front page story today on Whitewater in the Washington Times. Hillary's mystery phone call apparently routed to McCarty. Let's go to Santa Monica next. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Brian. Hi. Before I ask my question, I just wanted to, Mr. Brookheiser, I uh, am not going to have my usual morning coffee because when I turned the TV on and saw your outfit, I thought, gee, this is a wake up right here. <laughs> really nice. Thanks. <laughs> Let He's me trying, show you. trying to wake myself up. Let me show you. You, you all don't know how hard this is to be here at seven o'clock in the morning. Let this me show you another one of Mr. Brookheiser's outfits. This was in the New York Times. What what is this? My goodness. This is how I dress in New York. Where where is this photo? That's my house. And and is is that an all black? That's my outfit? living room. That's your living room. Wait, that was in the New York Times in February. Yes. Did you get any response out of that photo? Well, every uh, this, this was an article on uh, young conservatives. And this was done the last time it could possibly, I could possibly be in it, because I was just before I turned 40. So those days are now all gone. But uh, everybody else in the article didn't like their pictures. I, I think that's one of the best pictures that's ever been taken of me. Now that we have Santa Monica wide awake, go ahead. <laughs> yes, uh, Mr. Brookhiser, I wanted to ask you, in your, in your um, uh, the National Review, there was, an article, there was an article about a, a deal that... Uh, I have not read it. Uh, a deal that uh, uh, Clinton had made with the Russians. Hold on just a second. Can you hear her? We've lost. Uh, oh, I see. You're, you're, uh, <laughs> this is one of those you morning. Here. Yeah, we've got all these. Uh, Let me just plug him in. So he can, Now start again, please. Okay. <laughs> now I can hear you. All right. <laughs> there was supposed to have been an article in, your, in, the, in the National Review about the, a deal, some kind of a deal that, that Clinton had made with the Russians. Yes, that's in the um, yeah, that's in the issue that'll be coming out uh, today or tomorrow or Monday. It's it's the current issue, the the one after this one, and uh, our senior editor Peter Rodman, who actually supports going into Bosnia, the the magazine does not support the Clinton plan, but he does, but he has found he has found out that the administration has assured the Russians 
uh, that if they will cooperate with this Bosnian operation, not make trouble, that NATO expansion into Central Europe will be put on hold indefinitely, presumably. Now, Warren Christopher has already been asked about this. He's denied it. Of course, that's what he would do. Um, I don't see what's, uh, what's so startling about it. I mean, it is a scoop, but, but the, this administration has been dragging its heels on uh, NATO expansion uh, for years now. And uh, they've just decided to apparently formalize this in the interests of uh, making their Bosnia scheme go. Caller? Are you going to get into that anymore? Well, we, 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 we've broken the story. We've got it in the magazine. We've already been talking about it on, on, on talk shows in anticipation. And we're hoping to elicit some, uh, some reaction from the administration. I understand that uh, Speaker Gingrich has written or will write a letter to the White House saying, what gives here? Here's a fax from Doug Henry of Hanover, New Hampshire. I guess he moved there because up in the corner it used to be Haverhill. It says, uh, what does Chris, you don't like that, do you, when somebody I calls you Chris? I promised my mother. Um, Did your mother never, call you Chris? No, I promised my mother I'd never let anyone do it. Okay. So it's a waste of a nice name. What does Christopher think of his intellectual fairy tale utopia collapsing in France? I don't understand the grammar of the question. As far as I know, the 1789 uh, revolution is still uh, going strong. Next call, we go to Jacksonville, Florida. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I just had a couple questions regarding the uh, Bosnia and the reporting on that. Uh, I haven't seen really addressed, and I'm curious how they feel about the understanding of military operations by the Clinton administration into that nation. For example, in Somalia with the, the problem with the Bangladeshis and now with our troops, Going into Bosnia, there's a, a large problem there with snipers and mines. We're sending in a heavy force there, but I don't see the understanding on the Clinton administration regarding exactly what they're going to do in there and how they're going to deal with that threat, i.e. a sniper takes a shot in Sniper Alley, and how are you going to return fire with heavy armor and tanks? I know uh, Hillary was down there to... Uh, send the boys off and talk to the wise, but I'm understanding, will she be there at the airport when they come in with the casualties, too? Well, look, I, I, I think the Clinton administration believes that they have an agreement that all the three sides support. And if that is the case, then presumably, uh, well, they believe that, that there wouldn't be sniping or that there wouldn't be this problem. I, I think they're being, um, they're being too optimistic with this. Uh, and, and I also think their notion of, of what the goal of the mission would be is, is a little hazy, uh, which is the problem. If you have a goal and if it's absolutely necessary to you, you go in whether they're sniping or, or whatever it is. But I'm not sure that that, uh, that applies here. I was just in Bosnia, um, uh, not for the first time. I think um, this will sound odd perhaps to the caller, but the main problem is going to be the, the fact that the winter is coming on. If it wasn't for that, I think we would hear more of what we heard from the very first soldiers who went the other day, the advance party, who basically said that the whole place was a very pleasant surprise to them, that it's beautiful, that the people are very nice, it's a very civilized country, which all of which is absolutely true, and you'd never, you'd never know from most of the reporting. People are really, really fed up with the war. Even those who feel that, that, that it's not a just agreement at Dayton are just glad of the chance to have a breathing space. There will be a huge uh, penalty inflicted by Bosnians, in my opinion, or anyone who tries to restart this war. And um, the doctrine of overwhelming force promulgated so often by General Powell does seem to have been um, observed in this case. I mean, 20,000 Americans, to say nothing of huge contingents in the other NATO countries, is an enormous number of soldiers for a, for a country the size of Ohio. And I don't, I, it's true there are a lot of, of mines lying around, but I, don't, I, don't, I think it would be a very bold person indeed who, who tried to take on by sniper fire or any other method of warfare such a force. So uh, I've no doubt lived to have these words quoted uh, against me. But uh, it seems to me odd that um, I can't, I, I perhaps better not make a guess about the politics of the caller. Very odd that there, are, that there are still people who want to vote for the enormous new military appropriations that the, the Republican majority has imposed upon us but never want the United States uh, to use force anywhere. I don't know why, I think we, we should have it one way or the other. 
Later on in this program, we're going to talk with Philip Noyce, who is the director of the movie Clear and Present Danger, and the subject will be Hollywood and Washington and politics. <coughs> and also, uh, Senator Joseph Lieberman. Um, what do you think of Bill Bennett and Sam Nunn? And I'm trying to find the story here in the Times this morning. Uh, and <coughs> Joseph Lieberman going after these talk shows, advertisers. Well, look, if, if you don't like something, this is a boycott. This is a very libertarian way to, uh, to register your disapproval. Now, it's not entirely so because, of course, Lieberman and Nunn are senators. They're not, uh, they're not your average private citizen. But, uh, uh, but uh, certainly uh, anyone, a free marketeer has to say, well, if you, if you don't like this stuff, guys, this is the way to do it. In this story, and I can't uh, find it, well, it seems uh, oh, they it got the wrong advertiser on the... Well, they, they took on... Uh, Mars bars, right? Yeah, well, they started when they first cut this, the, uh, the commercial. Uh, let's see, continuing a crusade they started six weeks ago to take the trash out of daytime television talk shows. Bennett, Lieberman, Nunn, yesterday, named names, unveiling a television commercial that urged three companies to stop advertising their products on the racier programs. One of those, they had to recut it because they, they took on... Um, three musketeers of the Mars company, and the Mars company convinced them that they'd stop spending money with these you know, You know, Brian, my wife has been on a couple of these shows because she's a, uh, a psychoanalyst. What's her and, name? And uh, Jeannie Safer. She has a book coming out in February, actually. But uh, she's been on a couple of these shows because they want, you know, the expert to come on at the end and kind of tie everything up. And... Uh, it is an unsettling experience to be on them because, and of course they all vary, they do vary, there is a spectrum, but uh, especially as you get towards the bottom, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of schizophrenia to them because on the one hand, they are very uh, judgmental and, uh, and moralistic about the people that they have on as guests, you know, I slept with my father, all that kind of thing. But they are also uh, being titillating. I mean, they, they, are, they are luridly exposing this stuff for their own enjoyment. And, uh, and then I guess the final thing is the condescension and, and the contempt that is implicit in these things, uh, um, directed towards their guests and even towards the audience to a certain degree. So it's complicated. Oprah Winfrey, Winfrey has been kind of exonerated by this group as being okay. What's your reaction to this? Oprah Winfrey was once fantastically nice to my son when she, when I took him to the Oscars party that Vanity Fair gives every year. So I won't have a word said against her. In fact, as a, and as a reward for good behavior, I'm taking my son to see the money train um, this weekend, just, which I wasn't planning to see until Senator Dole told me I shouldn't go. Yeah, well, that was the, one of the things that, that started. Thinks that's, that's, he thinks that the crime on the New York subway is created by motion pictures. I think, really think he and Mr. Bennett both have far too much time on their hands. So you're going to, how old is your son now? He's 11. And you're taking him to see the money train yeah. this weekend? Yeah, as a reward for good behavior. For those who have never heard about the money train, what is it? Well, I don't know, except that I know uh, Senator Dole says I shouldn't go and see it because if it wasn't for the motion picture industry, there wouldn't be crime on the New York subways. I know that's wrong. So just to, in case anyone has been so foolish as to listen to Dole and not go, I'm going to go and put my dollars where my mouth is. Del Mar, California. Thanks for waiting. Yes, I think this, uh, there's a connection between the Americans not being taught history or literature the past 30 years and someone like Lenin getting elected in 1992. My main concern about him was his history as a young man. He was not anti-war. He actually supported a communist Vietnam. And I was very concerned that he'd be a very activist in foreign policy. And he has turned out to be just that. Where did you uh, see him uh, actively support a communist Vietnam? I think that was his activity in Europe. I think he organized demonstrations. Uh, I was a college student at that time. The campuses were organized. Lots of money flowed in to the United States. In fact, it was one of the fronts of the war were our campuses. And he organized demonstrations, what, to, for a communist government in Vietnam? Just, well, they said it was anti-war, but it was basically to help, the, help North Vietnam win the war. And that did help North Vietnam win the war when they turned public opinion against it. And now I'm concerned that here is this renegade president sending our young people to Bosnia to support a very a partition. Here he goes to Ireland where, where there was an unjust partition in the 20s. And he's against that, which he should be. And he's supporting this unjust partition which rewards the aggressors in Belgrade. And he's using our young people to stabilize it. Thanks. Mr. Berkheiser? Well, I, 
I guess the thought I have is that um, Americans, there's a reason why uh, so many generals have ended up being president. And uh, some of them have been excellent, some of them have been terrible. But that's the only profession outside politics that Americans have ever turned to for presidents. And that is because uh, war making and war leading is an important, uh, is, is a crucial matter. And when politicians lack that experience, um, it can get them into trouble uh, during their administration. But let me just show you this because mm -hmm. uh, it goes with what Mr. Burkheiser said about generals. Uh, this is at the bottom of Washington Wire today, Ron Schaefer's column on Friday in the Wall Street Journal. Powell's popularity soars even higher after he forgoes a presidential run with 61% of Americans expressing positive feelings about him. Well, I have actually, I have probably the biggest piece that's going to be done on the Powell campaign coming out in March in Forbes FYI. I went on the whole Colin Powell book tour. I've seen the bookstores of America and I saw, I saw the people uh, that that story refers to, the people who admire this man. You went on the whole Colin Powell book tour? Uh, I, missed, I missed eight cities, but that means I went to 18. I, I, let, me, let me come back to this in a second because I want to get Mr. Uh, Hitchens' reaction to all this. Um, well, to the lady who called in who I think is confused, um, I can just assure you, ma'am, um, I, was, I was at the same university as Mr. Clinton during that time. Oxford? Yeah. Um, I can tell you that there was no money from outside for our movement against the war. I can also tell you that um, Mr. Clinton was no extremist. If he had been an extremist, I would have known him. Um, I was the speaker at uh, most of those rallies. He was um, a mere moderate uh, attender. Um, he was considered very well behaved uh, by the people who were really genuinely militantly opposed to the war as I was. Still one of the proudest moments of my life was to have opposed that war. Mr. Clinton, you must have noticed, ever since has been, has been trying to apologize for his very mild opposition as much as he can and on every possible occasion. It's almost the only good position he's ever taken and he can't wait to, to run away from it. Let me just ask a quickie because we've got a caller waiting and I want to ask you more about the tour. But if the Bosnian thing leads to casualties, American casualties and more involvement, can the Republicans have it both ways when it's all over? Can they say we oppose this and we never wanted to go in there and be legitimate about it? I, I don't understand. What, what in other is words, the we had a caller earlier saying what they're really doing is yeah, no, they're, they're, having, no, they're asking they to have it both ways. They I'm just asking you whether you agree with the caller that suggests that Republicans want it both ways. They're not trying to stop the troops from going over there, but they're saying they're supporting the military. And then when it, if it does turn sour, they can come back and say, well, we had to support the military, but we didn't want to stop. Not having it both ways. I mean, the president has the responsibility. The president is the commander in chief. Uh, uh, de facto, it's evolved that the president controls our foreign policy in these ways. And uh, he would have done this. He had the power and he would have done this with or without Congress's yeah, but approval. Brian's question is, are the, is there a positioning going on on the other side of the aisle? In other words, are they trying to create a an impression that they can say we told you so if it doesn't work. I think, I think in a ham-handed way, a rather hesitant way, they are trying to do that. Well, Will it work? I, I guess that's my question, is it? No, because I think actually the American um, voters, who are obviously not keen on Bosnia, are, are not totally indifferent about it either. I think, there's, I think there's a bad conscience. There's an awareness that the United States could have done more earlier about it. There's a feeling that it's not, it's not a bad cause. And nor is it a, a hopeless adventure, that it's a sort of prudent risk that a superpower can decently take. And, but, but it's also not the case that, that uh, all the people who are opposed to this uh, are against doing anything in Bosnia. I mean, National Review has been urging for two or three years that we do things in Bosnia. We, just, we think that this is not the right thing. We hope it works. We're doubtful that it will. Call from North Little Rock, Arkansas. Thank you for waiting. Good morning, Brian. Hi. A fan. Uh, I was just a few things I would like to say. Uh, everybody keeps talking about Mr. Clinton. The thing about Mr. Clinton, he's Mr. Clinton done everything for Arkansas that Arkansas has got. Arkansas didn't wasn't doing nothing before Mr. Clinton. What's better down there now? Everything. The living for the poor, and that's one of the reasons why that. The Republican bunch don't like Mr. Clinton because he was out to help the poor and the blacks, especially. They, if he do, if he wasn't, if he hadn't have done, hadn't had the record of that, he would have been the better president. They would have done everything in 
they power to keep him in. But because he helped the poor, that's uh, why they got all the scandals on him, all of everything they come up with. I mean, you think people said, uh, you know, Mr. Clinton helped the poor, so we're going to get him on the scandals? Well, the same way they done JFK. They killed JFK because he had the deal of being nice to the black people. Who's and they? All. Who's they? All of the, this, the bunch that goes around and puts out all of them. The uh, all of these lies, if you if you want to say it. All right, thanks. Agree. I guess that's me, right? Kill um, JFK. Do either one of you agree with the gentleman's? No, I've been talking. So I mean, I took Mr. Clinton at his word when he said, "Come on, come on down." You remember that at the convention, uh, the Arkansas miracle, and so on. Very great friend of the rich in Arkansas. I mean, these are all the donors who we've since been finding about. About. But this man says he's a friend of the poor. Well, I have, would say I had a different impression that Mr. Mr. Clinton was, um, look, what, Arkansas doesn't have a civil rights statute yet. I think it's the almost the only state that doesn't. It, it's a right-to-work state. It's very hard to join a union. It's a, extremely backward in all those respects. Um, the income disparities are, are colossal, but there is a great deal of wealth there. That's true. And Mr. Clinton knows almost everyone who's involved in, uh, in holding the purse strings. M Mr. Brookheiser. That's the sort of governor that he was. Um, what was it, 28 days on the tour? Uh, I was there 18. I did 18 days. 18 days. I mean, you physically went to every... All these book signings. I was and so all the press conferences. And, 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 and would you stand around and uh, watch it, or what? Well, what you did, uh, there was always a press conference about 10 minutes before each one of these things. And uh, then you looked at the line, and you talked to people on the line, and you, see, you, you, you saw what they had to say. And uh, I think uh, General Powell was a screen on which a lot of Americans were projecting their desires. Uh, and, and this will end if he does ultimately run for president because he's going to have to take positions, he's going to have to take issues. He'd begun to do that, but he would do more and more and uh, he'd get his own personality and it would be harder to make him this white screen. How many of, on average, uh, of the percentage of the people that showed up for autographs were white? Uh, it was about eight to one ratio, and that was pretty consistent. Some places, Milwaukee actually had the highest percentage of, of black people on the line. And what did, uh, did you and the general become close friends? No. <laughs> did you talk at all other than I asked him questions in, in the press conferences. What is but, your, uh, you know, what's your take on him as a, I mean, do you, do you like him or not? Or he's, you... he's a solid guy in a lot of ways, um, personally. Uh, temperamentally. I think the great, um, the great lack that he has, and this would be the great distinction between him and the first general president, the subject of my book, is that uh, uh, General Powell has no ideas and sees no need to have any. And, and you, he's a non-ideological man. Did you do this because you had this book coming out? No, I did it because the editor of Forbes FYI called me up and said, what are you doing with the next month of your time? Would you like to do this? And I said, in a minute. Would you like to have done that? No, I would not. I'm, I was, I'm really uh, disappointed. So I was thinking I might get a Colin Powell free uh, TV program. And the, what, this would be one of the benefits of him finally having deigned to tell us that he's not going to run. I was so relieved. I actually won some money on it, too. I thought also now, now not every conversation that I have will be poisoned by speculation about this complete non-entity. I mean, non-entity in the sense that uh, Richard describes him as having no ideas and no convictions and, I would add, no principles. But not, unfortunately, non-entity in his, in his record. I mean, he's been, he was uh, able to play an undignified part in um, the war in Vietnam and helping to cover up the Milai massacre. He was able to play a disgraceful role in the invasion of Panama. He lied directly to Congress about his role in the Iran-Contra scandal. Um, and I, I, like, I like to think that he... Um, he decided to bow out because he would have finally had to answer these questions if, um, if he'd run. But, the, but a merciful press made sure that he was never asked them while he was uh, dithering. Next week, as we've said, uh, we're going to have our satellite truck and cameras in uh, Ohio all week. Every morning on the show, we're going to focus on one of eight men who were president of the United States. And the interesting thing about this discussion is that a lot of them were generals. William Henry Harrison, Benjamin Harrison. Uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, James Garfield, 
Maybe, maybe McKinley. McKinley was an officer. I think yeah. he was a captain or a major. Major, I think he was a major. But the idea for that next week is, and it starts Sunday, is that you can compare what was going on in those different presidencies. It's one state. It's a way for us to concentrate in one area and see if the issues they were discussing then have any relevance to what's going on now. Or maybe better put, is there anything new uh, in, in present-day politics? San Francisco, thanks for waiting. Good morning. Hi. To you and your erudite guests. Uh, <laughs> Good morning, uh, Chronicle uh, has Bosnia, the budget, uh, Newt Gingrich, and uh, the continuing uh, tawdry tale of a trial in San, San Francisco Federal District Court, uh, uh, in which uh, the a police, woman police officer has uh, sued uh, the police chief of San Francisco for sexual harassment. Um, by the way, uh, President Harding died in San Francisco in 1923 at the Palace Hotel uh, on a campaign trip. Two How? quick questions, Brian. Uh, yeah. If only you can answer, and maybe Chris. Um, one is uh, the background music that's played during uh, quorum calls and votes, uh, it, it, the classical music. Uh, it would be appreciated if you could uh, identify, you know, what some of the music is. And also there's a lot of great American classical music, uh, by Freddie Groffet and uh, George Gershwin, you might think about that. And the other is in Prime Minister's Question Time. The first question is always uh, question number one from the Conservatives, and uh, the uh, Prime Minister Major always says that he uh, had, had meetings in the morning and will have meetings in the afternoon, et cetera, et cetera. Then subsequently, uh, there will be popped up a question, question number four or number six, to which the Prime Minister always refers uh, to uh, saying, uh, <clears throat> I refer the honorable gentleman to the answer I gave some moments before. And could they all be the same question? What does it all mean? I'll take the answer off the air. Thanks. I, I think that's a great way to conduct this program. Mr. Brookheiser, question number three. And, you know. Well, yeah, because um, I, can't, I can't enlighten you on this, I think. The questions are all printed on the order paper, so most people, um, they have to be, in fact. But the question is usually phrased deceptively. The, the person says, has the Prime Minister any plans to visit, say, Manchester, if that's where he represents, that's where his constituency is. And if the Prime Minister says, yes, he has, then the supplementary would be, well, if he came to Manchester, this is what he would find out, people thought about his policies and so on. They try and set traps in this way while asking pro forma questions. Um, so the, do the dodge is to say, I've heard that one before, and I've also answered it. So we'll we'll uh, take that question and, and, and elaborate on this. never do that. No, absolutely. It only happens but, in the mother but, You know, but by the way, uh, Lincoln, during the Civil War, was approached by a delegation of senators, and, and it was suggested to him that they have a question time, and the, and the president have to come to the Hill and answer questions. And he took the dodge of um, pleading national security and said he wouldn't do it. But I still think it would be a very good idea. Well, you, know, you know why we stopped doing that? It actually happened uh, when a treaty with the Creek Indians was being proposed in Washington's first administration. You know, the Constitution says, with the advice and consent of yes. the Senate, treaties uh, are negotiated. Well, we have the consent of the Senate, but we have never had a president going to the Senate to ask for its advice because we did it once. And this was with a treaty with the Creek Indians. Uh, Washington actually went to the Senate with his plans of what he was going to have his negotiators say. And uh, it was such a, uh, such a botch. First of all, the windows were open. No one could hear it as it was being read. So finally they got the windows closed. Then a discussion ensued. People asked for more papers. Washington lost his temper a bit. He says, this defeats my whole purpose of coming here. He left. Uh, weekend passed. He came back on a Monday. He was fine. Everything, everything went. But he was heard to say as he left, uh, uh, he would be damned before he came there again. If he can plug his book, why can't I plug mine? You can plug it. As a matter of fact, there's a picture here I want to ask you about right here. Mm -hmm. Why did you include this picture of a deceased Robert Maxwell with uh, Mother Teresa pr praying the rosary? <clears throat> well, the book is about all, this, all the shady connections of Mother Teresa and all the things that you should know about her and don't. Her connections with basically with either um, right-wing dictatorships or with um, corrupt right-wing businessmen. Like, uh, are you calling Mr. And Keating so, a corrupt um, right-wing businessman? I'm calling Mr. Keating because the model of the, of the Lincoln Savings and Loan is the model of a corrupt right-wing businessman. He's currently doing 10 years for it. Um, 
he gave her a million and a quarter dollars of stolen money, which she's yet to return, though the court in Los Angeles has asked her for the money. She, she won't give it back. He, in his turn, got from her a, a crucifix and the use of a private jet. Um, sorry, he gave her the private jet, she gave him the crucifix and many, many indulgences and pieces of support. Maxwell used her for a fundraising pyramid scheme to back um, one of his newspapers while he was raiding its pension fund. So that I just think the picture's so hilarious of her sitting there with her rosary while he's on the phone apparently drumming up custom. Here's what the cover of the book looks like. Um, how much does this cost, by the way? There you have me. Um, you don't I, know? I ought, I ought to know and I don't. It doesn't say. Anything. And it doesn't say. Jones Island, South Carolina. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jones Island. You're on the air. There you go. Hello. Oh, hello. Good morning, Brian. How you doing? Um, just fine, sir. Um, good morning, gentlemen. And my question is to Christopher Higgins. And I am... Hitchens, I'm sorry. I always get so nervous. I'm so glad you're back to the subject of the book. Um, concerning Mother Teresa, I heard a brief report last week <coughs> that she had entered into prayer for AIDS children, babies that are born dying of AIDS. Um, you know, she wants a cure. And then there is this lady, I believe she's in New York, and I think her name is, they call her Mother Jones. She takes a lot of these abandoned mm -hmm. babies from the hospital, and under uh, <coughs> funds, I suppose, I'm not too sure, she um, takes care of them. Um, what I would like to know is what is your opinion as a society? <coughs> How should, what, what obligations would we have, should we have, on taking care of babies that are born dying? And I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you. Well, um, I, ca I can't believe that this woman, by the way, is able to take dying or AIDS uh, suffering babies from a hospital in order to look after them. But it's, I suppose it's possible. If the story went, went past my bat. Um, I think that uh, we're in a very grave moment just now. Um, that's partly why I wanted to bring up the arrest of those clergymen at the Rotunda yesterday, um, where it seems that the, that, uh, the society, at least ex as expressed by, by Congress and through the wish of the President, is, is going to say that it doesn't want any longer to shoulder the burden of responsibility for all American children. I'd like to ask... They're going to cut them off the bottom of the roll. The, the two of you, uh, what, what do you think of... Uh, Talked to Christopher Hitchens for years about. There's the price. Yes, twelve. It's twelve ninety-five. A snip at the price. Um, what do you think of him being? I don't know if the word is obsessed, but you certainly have written and talked a lot about Mother Teresa over the last couple of years. Well, I don't think it's obsession. Thank you. You have a no. Look, I mean, you 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 have a subject, and you're uh, you're taking it on. And I haven't read the book, yet, so I'm not going to comment. I suspect. I suspect it's a little harsher than I would be, at least. But uh, I wouldn't. If, if you'd been doing this for forty years, then I might. Then we might be getting into obsession. But it keeps uh, on a couple up, years. It keeps on coming up. This um, this week, um, the the nastiest thing that Michael Mandelbaum and his co-authors and critique of Clinton's foreign policy can find to say about it is that um, it's the foreign policy of Mother Teresa. In other words, they by which they they mean or think they mean that it's. It's naive to the point of being too charitable. Of course, what I argue about Mother Teresa is that she's the reverse of that. In the reports of the uh, vote on um, divorce in Ireland uh, recently, for example, where Ireland was until last week the only country in Europe where divorce was illegal, finally in a referendum, the Irish people voted against the advice of the church um, and voted to legalize divorce. Mother Teresa intervened very heavily on the other side. Um, which is the sort of thing she tends to do. She's always involving herself in political disputes in other countries. She's basically a, a political rather than charitable figure. The reports that mention this mention it in a bewildered way as if even Mother Teresa got involved rather than as if that's just what you'd expect her to do. And so as long as that impression is so widespread, I suppose I have to keep on trying to correct her. Uh, speaking of, of bedfellows and connections mm -hmm. and all this stuff, uh, this is a, just a little piece in the National Journal and, and I want to ask you to explain what this means. There's a, a, a art piece here with uh, it's President Lincoln there with a you know with a camera and there's no face on it but it says okay what's Jude really up to and and this is in the National Journal at the bottom of the page it came out today it says in an odd bedfellows alliance conservative political activist and economic consultant Jude Winiski is backing the candidacy of De Democratic Representative Robert G Torricelli 
for a New Jersey Senate seat. <clears throat> Winiski, and the reason I ask this is you say you're writing for Forbes FYI, and <clears throat> Jude Winiski's been involved with Steve Forbes and I, I guess presidential candidacy. Winiski, who recently hosted a dinner at a midtown Manhattan restaurant at which his wealthy Wall Street clients met the candidate, said he told Torricelli, quote, if there weren't an active, lively Democratic Party, the Republican Party would continue right until it ran into Adolf Hitler, unquote. A, a, a shift toward Hitler, Winiski elaborated, would be toward a government that's, quote, no compassion, ellipses, all individualism. What's Jude Winiski <laughs> up to? Can no you compassion us? is certainly a, a mild description of a government that's like Adolf Hitler. Uh, look, I read The Way the World Works when it came out. His book. His book in uh, the late 70s. I thought it was very important. I'll always acknowledge my debt to it. But Jude Winiski told me during the last election cycle that Ross Perot was going to win an overwhelming majority in the Electoral College unless the leaders of the world, world finance had him assassinated. I'll say no more. Las Vegas, thanks for waiting again. I'm sorry to keep you folks on the line. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, I'm reading the Las Vegas Review uh, Journal and The Sun. Wait, I have it right here. No, you don't. Yes, yes I do. <laughs> I thought I did. Sorry. Okay. I, I must have left it uh, in, in the restroom. Oh, for heaven's sake. Uh, I'm, two things. Is uh, Boswinian aid $600 million to re re rebuild the country? And uh, that will run into billions of dollars. And then I go down and I see I'm an ex-Californian. I moved out of there six years ago because you couldn't even move in the traffic. But uh, they have an Im immigrant influx there, and they've got three and a half million legal immigrants and two and a half million illegals. Now they're all applying for citizenship so they can vote. And they say that if they had voted then, that 187, the proposition wouldn't have passed. Well, here I am living in Nevada, and I have to pay taxes for those people. Even though I don't vote in California, I don't live there and I vote from Nevada, I'm still paying for these illegal immigrants. You're also less living in the fastest growing city in America. Do you know that? Oh, yes. Uh, the traffic is getting just as tremendous as it was in California when I left. What's uh, either one of your reaction to our caller's initial comment about immigrants? Well, look, uh, uh, America, I, I don't think you can dogmatize on this to, uh, to have a position that applies in all cases. And in fact, American immigration policy, uh, or American immigration, has varied over the last 200 years. We've had periods when very few immigrants were coming in, and then we've had periods when a lot have come in. It's gone in cycles. It hasn't been a steady thing. Now, up until this century, these cycles were controlled by uh, events in Europe, mostly, uh, wars, famines, uh, you had a famine, you got people, you had wars often that prevented people from coming. They were controlled by external events. But as we've gotten into the 20th century, uh, travel to America has become easy enough and cheap enough so that we no longer have this uh, external regulator on it. And if we want to maintain the policy, policy that we've had over two centuries, and which has worked, that is to say uh, uh, cyclical. You have ingestion and then you have digestion. If we want that, we have to do that ourselves uh, by our own laws. And I think it's time for a period of digestion. Richard Brookheiser, are you still writing a column for the Observer? Yes, I am. Are you still writing for Time Magazine? Uh, occasionally. Are you still writing for the Talk of the Town in the New Yorker? Uh, probably not since I was Tina Brown. In the New Yorker? No, in the New York Observer. Why that's, did you attack that's, that's going against, uh, that's going against uh, Goliath with only David-like weapons. So but, you're, uh, you're out of there? I guess so. Uh, and uh, you're still with the National Review? Yes. Since 1977 yes. and a graduate of Yale? Yes. And are you still supporting and, uh, marijuana? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'm focusing on medical marijuana. I mean, I, I have opinions on all the drug laws, but uh, since I had cancer years ago and uh, for chemotherapy, and um, marijuana is very effective against the nausea, and I think it's insane that people are unable to get it for medical purposes. What kind did you have? Uh, marijuana or no, cancer? cancer. <laughs> Testicular cancer. And are you clear? Yes. Uh, and we saw you during that period, you just 
you went ahead on, on television and you wore the band, you know, the, let your hair, did you lose your hair? Uh, Quentin Crisp said an existentialist is someone who shaves his head when he's going bald. So, you know, I was told my hair was going to fall out, so I said I'm not going to wait around for it to fall out, I'm just going to shave it off. Was that hard during that period to appear publicly and... No, no, you got used to it. You pick your bandana as well, you look kind of cool. And Mr. Hitchens, uh, you, you write for Vanity Fair and The Nation and have your book and other things? Uh, that's it for now. Is that enough? Promoting the book? Mm, yes, it's plenty. And has your brother Peter gone back home? He's gone back home, so the Hitchens Dog and Pony show is over for now. Do you miss him? Yes, I'd have to say I did, yeah. There aren't that many intelligent conservatives in Washington that we can afford to lose uh, one like my brother. We have time for one last call. Macon, Georgia. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes. Uh, a couple calls ago, a uh, gentleman was talking about the uh, travel gate, uh, so-called travel gate, and he mentioned that uh, Reagan, if that would have been Reagan, it'd have been press have been all over him. <laughs> that's almost, that's ludicrous. Uh, Reagan was the Teflon <laughs> president. Everything slid off of him. I mean, he had probably the most corrupt cabinet that uh, in the history of this country. He had four or five guys indicted, uh, and, and if people would be truthful, really truthful. Clinton's doing a better job than Bush did. I mean, Clinton's doing a pretty good job as a president. And uh, Did you vote for him? Uh, yeah, I voted for him. And on what basis do you say he's doing a better job? Well, the economy's better. Uh, his foreign policy's not that bad. Haiti's a lot better off than it was. I mean, the, the, the Caribbean. I mean, we know, we know weaker. I mean, he's, he's doing just a good job, but I mean, he's doing a better job than Bush. Mr. Hitchens, is that true? Um, it's, it's true for Haiti, um, I must say. Um, but I, uh, people who think of um, politics in terms of lesser evil, I think, have to accept all the logical and probable consequences of what they believe. And I don't believe any Republican administration would have dared do what the Clinton administration is doing uh, about welfare especially as it affects children. I think they would have been so afraid of what the Democrats would have said and maybe done about it. There's some, there's some jobs so dirty only a Democratic administration can do them, and that is part of the lesser evil calculus, unfortunately. It's the thing that people usually leave out. But your, whatever, everything you said about Reagan is, of course, completely true. Mr. Berkheiser? Well, the, Regan, uh, the reason Reagan had Teflon was not that he was charming or that he gave a good speech. It was that he had... Uh, ideas and beliefs that were consistent over 30 or 40 years. People knew where he stood. Uh, a lot of people disliked it, like the caller, presumably. A majority liked it. And so he kept ahead, he kept forging ahead, and people were willing to cut him a lot of slack. This book, um, Founding Father, Rediscovering George Washington by Richard Brookheiser, on the bookshelves in the stores in February 22nd. 22nd. A magic Easy to remember. Day in American history. And this book is out there now. It's uh, Mother Teresa, the missionary position. Did you name this book, by the way? Yes. 12.95 in the bookstores. It was either that or Sacred Cow, and I thought Sacred Cow would be in bad taste. Chris Christopher Hitchens and Richard Brookheiser, thank you both. Thank you. We'll pause here for a moment. Justice, but it is perhaps peace, and peace is better than nothing. Mr. Brookheiser, where are you? Well, we, National Review, has been calling uh, for years that, uh, that the Bosnian, that the Muslims be trained, uh, that they be allowed to arm themselves, uh, but we, we don't like the Dayton Agreement. It seems to be putting the United States in the role of enforcing a peace which nobody on the ground really likes. They, they like it only because they're exhausted or they're temporarily exhausted. And, uh, and, and people have lost sight of the, of the notion of a limited national interest. I mean, we have a real national interest in stopping aggression in Europe, but uh, since the Serbs are not animated by any hostile superpower or by any hostile ideology, our interest is a limited one. And if there are people on the ground, as there are, who are willing to fight this, we should help them and let them do it. Here's the cover of a new book coming out, uh, Founding Father, George Washington Rediscovering. What would he think of this whole move to Bosnia? Well, we do, look, uh, the book is not, my book is uh, February 22nd, by the way, is when it's coming out. Easy date, day. easy date to remember. And the point of the book is not to say uh, to look at 200-year-old policy prescriptions and say what he would think now. 
Uh, the point of the book is to ask, why is this man famous? But it may not be the point, but I want to ask you. Oh, you want to ask it? Well, what do you think? Well, he, he, he was against habitual alliances with foreign powers, he said, but, but in fact is unlimited in practice. And, uh, and the Senate uh, took an opportunity to, uh, to vote against a, an egregious form of abortion. And I think we will see other, other restrictions coming out of this Congress. And this puts, and this puts the, the pro-abortion side in a box because they don't ever want to talk about the details of abortion. Yeah, there was a very um, strong piece there by a woman who'd undergone this procedure um, in the Times, New York Times op-ed page about a week ago, which uh, must have had a strong effect on me. I mean, she described what happened when your baby has, though it's quite well on, has in fact died inside you. And in her case, she was told it wasn't possible to induce it um, or remove it by a cesarean section uh, for various reasons that were to do with her own state of health. That this was the only way of ridding herself, actually, of a fetus that was already dead. And she said also the procedure isn't as scary and horrifying as it somehow has been made out. The very lurid things we've been told about crushing the skull with scissors and so forth aren't, aren't true. In fact, the dead child could be handed to her for a leave-taking uh, in reasonable condition before um, it's taken away. So, I don't know, I mean, I certainly would, would ask anyone who wants to think seriously and morally about this to look up, look up that piece. You, uh, you walked in with this piece on your agenda. Christians against welfare cuts are arrested in the Capitol by Frank Kleins and a barely noticed counterpoint to the budget battle. 55 evangelical Christian preachers and followers were arrested in the Capitol Rotunda today as they saw Richard Brookheiser with all that color on this morning. Uh, what are you reading? What am I reading? I'm reading the stories on, uh, on the, uh, the House of Representatives signing a letter um, uh, protesting the president's policies on Bosnia. And well, of all the things, you, when you pick up the papers this morning, why did this get your attention? Well, on the Washington Times, it gets your attention because you have uh, this picture of a flag being stepped upon, and then it says 184 congressmen urge president to cancel mission. Then in the New York Times, which buried it in the middle, but they say it was 201 members, including 15 Democrats, had signed the letter which said simply, we urge you, Mr. Clinton, not to send ground troops to Bosnia. Christopher Hitchens, uh, you came into this room saying you saw the same thing, the same photo. I was interested in the same photograph because I was wondering if the Washington Times hadn't um, violated the provisions of the flag burning amendment that I think it otherwise editorially favors. Um, there's a, an outright desecration right on the front page of our local conservative. Right. I think, I have certainly hope, that when the amendment passes, it won't be lawful to show pictures of the American flag being blasphemed in that bank. You they can put it in air quotes, can't they? And these are I foreigners. I suppose these are dirty ironic, foreigners. They can put ironic. But I also notice, as Richard, I think, uh, did, that um, in one of the pictures of the desecration, you can see somebody wearing a Redskins hat. Some ang That's the Washington Post, some page one of the Post. Infuriated Serb. No, it's not on the front of the Post. So it's the other, I think it's the Times one. Um, some infuriated Serb. Where, where is it in the Times? Trashing old glory. And no, Washington Post. Redskins cap. Washington Post, Here, there it is. Let's show are. the audience. Can we get that up? Can we this is not a color photograph. It doesn't have the same impact, does it? No. And this is on the front page of the Washington Post. A Bosnian Serb soldier holds up a torn American flag during a demonstration by several thousand Serb residents, where's the red skin from? Oh, it's right here. Right. There it is. How about that? What does that mean? The, what does it mean? Well, it's an interesting choice of, um, he must home, be. of hometown reporting as well, because the Washington Times has missed the possibility of... Uh, well, he must, have been, he must have been the guy who photographed the other picture for the Washington Times, <laughs> presumably. Could, before we move on, to, let me ask the, the, yes. the two of you. What, what is, uh, <clears throat> if you're a conservative or if you're a liberal, what's the position you're going to take in a situation like this Bosnian uh, whole issue and uh, it doesn't split on conservative liberal does it no uh, it doesn't I mean, I've I wish that the international community had intervened a long time before now in Bosnia and I found that on the whole um, people on the left which is where I start from were not as keen as I was and there were some very bizarre people on the right who were making the or I think bizarre who are sort of making the running, actually, principally Baroness Thatcher, um, 
who were saying, look, there's no, there's no reason at all to let the Serbs keep on doing this, and, and it's a disgrace and it ought to be stopped. So you're for intervening? Well, I'm not very, much, I'm not very strongly in favour of the Dayton Agreement, which I think is a bit of a sellout. I mean, I, I think the Bosnian presidency is right in saying that it is not just... If you have an ongoing alliance, you are a slave to that, to that friendliness with another country. Uh, which is not, not pertinent in this case because we don't have any historical um, alliance or antipathy with any of the sides. Mr. Uh, Hitchens, this book, which you wrote uh, with Mother Teresa on the cover, when I first thought I thought it might have been Mother Teresa's book that's out. Uh, what would she think of this whole? She would not be, I think, under that impression. She does have a book out of her own, or at least it's been ghostwritten for her. It's called A Simple Path. Um, I think the only fair thing to recommend is that you go to your nearest fine bookstore and order both of them. Um, but the contrast will be, will be instantly, I think, available to you. What else are the two of you uh, reading this morning? Uh, we have uh, the Washington Post, page uh, one, had a story on the vote on, to ban partial birth abortions in the Senate. Yeah, we have paper there. this morning. Yeah. It's huge here. Okay, where is 55 it? 55 to 45. It's, uh, oh. it's uh, we're, we're A1. A1. 55, 45. Well, we can't find it. Anyway, why did that get your attention? Well, it got my attention because um, this, this may be the beginning of, or certainly an extension of, rolling back the, uh, the right to abortion that was established in Roe versus Wade. Uh, which appeared to be limited in the Supreme Court's language, 